Good morning. Welcome back to Momentum Church. <laughs> uh, hope you've had a good start to your year. Some people have already had it start, not how they were expecting it to, but I'm so thankful God's in control. Uh, we're glad you're here in person and online. The scripture I'd like to share with you before we get started, Psalm 143, 8, let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I've put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go. For to you, I entrust my life. I'm so thankful that we can trust God to lead. He's so smart, smarter than we are. Let's stand up and worship together. God, I thank you for our church family. God, I thank you for what you have planned for us this morning, and I thank you for the people that are on their way. Uh, I just thank you for this opportunity and the freedom we have to worship you. Thank you for your presence here already. Thank you for this time that we can just set aside and lift you up and put more trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship. Amen. Darkness tries to roll over my boat. Sorrow comes to steal. Brokenness and pain is all I know. I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. My faith doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My faith doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My faith doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to hide. I'm not a captive to the lies. I'm not afraid I won't be shaken I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I Fear doesn't stand a chance. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your
We serve a pretty amazing God. I'm so thankful that we have opportunities to come together as a church family and worship him as well as just time at our house or driving down the road. He's so, so good. You guys can all be seated. And we're going to take this time right now and give back to Jesus another way um, by receiving this morning's tithes and offerings. So if the crew that said that they would do it would come forward, I'll pray while they make their way forward. Jesus, I thank you for how you provide. I thank you that you are our provider. God, I thank you for our jobs and our future provisions. God, I pray that we would just let you lead and trust in that. God, I thank you for right now that we have an opportunity to give back to you. I pray that you would just bless this offering. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We have a couple announcements this morning. This week, starting today, is just a week of focused prayer as a church family. If you don't have our church app in the seat back in front of you, there's one of these. If you don't know how to make this show up on your phone, ask somebody that looks younger than me and we will make sure that it will get on your phone. This shows you what our focus is for each day that we're praying and it gives you updates on our church family and when there are events coming up. This just is a great place to, it's a good thing to have on your phone. So this week or today is consistency, just that we would pray that we as individuals and as a church family would be consistent in prayer. This week that will lead to a year of 2024 that is just focused on God leading and remembering to pray. Okay, so today we're going to pray over consistency over ourselves and over our church family. Um, and if you need the rest of the list of the things that we're going to focus on to pray about, we'll help you make sure that you have it before you leave today. This Wednesday, we're coming back to Wednesday night group. So we've got youth group up here. In the back, we've got the adult Bible study. And in the basement, we have kids church. We all eat together at six. So come have dinner with us and hang out with your church family and get closer to Jesus. And then this next Saturday, there will be a ladies craft day from 10 to three in the overflow. And then Loretta has with her just little cards that will have the next four craft days um, and details. So if you are a female, any age and want to join us just crafting and hanging out together, it's great. And then we go to lunch pretty close at a fast food place and just spend the day together and we're just making memories together and it's super fun. So kiddos, you can head to kids church. If you didn't sign your kid in, please make sure you just head back there with them really quick and sign them in. And then remember to pick them up at the end. And once they've cleared the area, let's all stand back up again and go greet somebody, hug somebody. Ready, go. A message? No, I'm just kidding. All right, please uh, go ahead and find your seats. (laughs) 
As you're finding your seats, I'm going to pray real quick. Heavenly Father, I need you. Ask that you would have your way this morning. That you would uh, speak to each and every one of us. No matter what we're, where we're at, where we're, what we're facing, what we're going through. Lord Jesus, I believe that we need you as well. Not just me. Please have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Well, Happy New Year. Yay! <laughs> Everybody's excited for it, right? It was so good last year. We get another year. So every year I pray and ask God what he would have for us as a church, right? I ask him uh, for a word specifically. Uh, and uh, the, the word that I'm still processing and still trying to figure out is the word that I feel like he's given to us. It's two words and not just one. It's so that. Now, the word is a conjunction, right? And so it puts two things together. Conjunction, junction, what's your function? You remember this? Uh, and so uh, there's something here and then there's a so that or a that and then there's something here. Let me give you an example of a so that. So Jesus was telling his disciples that things are going to get really rough, that they're going to scatter that uh, they're going to bail on him. Uh, they're going to do all these things that they just cannot picture in this moment, right? In John 16, 33, it says this. I have told you all these things. So he's told them all this stuff that you're going to run away from me. You're going to leave me. You're going to go your own directions. I've told you all these things. So that... In me, you may have peace in this world. You will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So the picture is this. Uh, and, and I apologize if maybe, maybe somebody's uh, shared the word of God with you and, and said, once you come into a relationship with Jesus, everything is peachy keen and real easy. Uh, it's not, right? And so Jesus is saying this to his disciples. These are Jesus' words. He said, hey, hey, you're going to have rough time. You're going you're gonna to go through all this stuff. And I'm going to tell you this so that you may have peace. Right, this word peace in scripture is shalom, which is not just like, Oh, it's so peaceful and calm like a clear water or a still water. But the peace is completeness, wholeness. It's greater than maybe even just the word peace can describe. And then, then he, he, he keeps on going, right? He, he says, and in the end, I need you to know that all that you're facing, all that you're going through, I, I've overcome the world. So, so you can have completeness, wholeness, knowing <laughs> that the job's done. That you, you may go through stuff, uh, but that's not the end. There's hope in the middle of it. Now, I need you to flip your Bibles all the way to the Old Testament. 1 Samuel chapter 21. Now we've been, uh, before Christmas, before December, we're doing, we're going through the Old Testament and we're going to get back to it. Uh, and here, here's this picture, right? David. David, he slays the giant. He cuts off his head and he runs around with his head and he's got victory and it's just an amazing moment. And then all the ladies were singing, 
Saul has killed his thousands. David has tens of thousands. And so all this praise is going to David. And and not only that, but David gets elevated. He's a young guy and and he gets promoted. Saul promotes him. He marries Saul's uh, daughter. and, And things are just amazing and going great. But that statement, Saul has, who is king, Saul has killed his thousands, David his tens of thousands, kind of didn't sit right with Saul. And Saul got more and more and more angry with David, right? And so much so that Saul determined that he was going to murder David. In fact, all the promotions that David gave, or Saul gave to David, were hopes that he would die. Right? In hopes that he'd be murdered in battle. We're hopes that even, even Mary and his daughter. Oh, my daughter. She can, she can mess with them. Uh, even that. Isn't that crazy? So, so David is on this like major high. Everybody's looking at him. Everybody's saying how great he is. And then Saul turns it around. It starts just going after him himself. David hides in a field for three days, trying to decide what's next. What do I do? Can you imagine the feelings that David must have had? I mean, he had all this victory, all this great stuff happening in his life. Look at what he saw God do through him. Amazing. Then everything seems to go downhill. So, so what does David do in response to all this? He, he does something that's interesting, right? He decides to run. He runs and he hides. Interesting, right? I mean, just like of all the things that he could do, he runs and he hides. And what does he do? When he runs, does he, does he go and build up this coalition, coalition to defeat this king? He doesn't. Does he, does he run uh, for love and comfort to people that are close to him? He actually, he doesn't. He goes to this place called Nod. Can you say that with me? Nod. Now, it's important that you don't do that today, but just say it with me. Nod. Uh, <laughs> can we say it again? Nod. Oh, man, you're not saying it. Nod. Nod. Thank you so much. All right. Way to go. So he goes to this place called Nod. And at Nod, in the Old Testament, they had this thing called the tabernacle. And they pack it up and they... And they move it from place to place, right? And it represented the presence of God. So of all the places that David goes, he goes to... Thank you. So David went to Nod and Ahimelech, the priest, Ahimelech trembled when he met him and asked, why are you alone? Why is no one with you? Isn't that an interesting statement just right from the get-go? I mean, think about David. David is all of a sudden known as this great warrior and he's standing in front of this priest and the priest is going, what's going on? We don't know if, if, well, actually we do know that at least half of the kingdom knew what was going on, knew that Saul was after David, right? They knew and Ahimelech, here standing here and his, his knees are banging together. What do I do? What's going on? Why aren't you with people? You're all alone. And David answered Ahimelech, the priest, the king charged me with certain matters and said to me, no one is known is to know anything about your mission and your instructions. As For my men, I have told them to meet me in a certain place. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever you can find. Isn't that interesting? 
So the Bible calls David a man after God's own heart. And here he is. He's doing what to the preacher? He's lying. Does that mean that God condones lying? No. And it means that God's people are flawed. And what's interesting about this moment is that Saul comes in and he slaughters all 85 of the priests. All because of a lie. So it has consequences. So, give me what you have. Give me five loaves of bread or whatever you can find. That's interesting. Do you, can you think of any other places in scripture where it says five loaves of bread? The feeding of the 5,000. That interesting. Uh, but the priest answered David, I don't have any ordinary bread on hand. However, there is some consecrated bread here, provided the men have kept themselves from women. And David replied, indeed, women have been kept from us as usual, whatever, uh, whenever I set out. The men's things are holy, even on missions that are not holy. How much more so today? So the priest gave him the consecrated bread since there was no bread except the bread of the presence that had been removed from the, before the Lord and replaced by hot bread on the day it was taken away. Now, one of Saul's servants was there that day and detained before the Lord and he was Doeg the Edomite. Saul's head shepherd. David asked Ahimelech, don't you have a spear or a sword here? I haven't brought my sword or any other weapon because the king's business was urgent. And the priest replied, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine whom you killed in the valley of Elah is here. It is wrapped in cloth behind the ephod. If you want it, take it. There is none, excuse me, take it. There is no sword here but that one. And David said, there is none like it. Give it to me. Now, look at the, look at the situation that David's in. Everything comes crashing down. And where does he go? He goes to the tabernacle. He goes to, to find hope. He, he's wandering everything and he has no hope. And so then he goes and he seeks hope. But what's interesting, I mean, we see that he asked for five loaves of bread, right? And then the priest responds, verse uh, four. The priest responds, hey, I don't have any ordinary bread. Right? I, we, we've got nothing. We're tapped out. In fact, all we got left is the bread that is consecrated. The bread that, that, that is, is for God, right? So, so here's the picture. The, the bread would be put on the altar, given to God, and, and it would be for the priest to consume. Only the priest. And this, this bread was a thank offering. It was thanks to God for him sustaining them, for him uh, protecting and providing for them. It was a bread that, that symbolized Something even greater than just sustaining and protecting and providing. This bread uh, represents this everlasting covenant that God had with the Israelites. You can read about it in Leviticus 24 if you ever want to flip there. Uh, and, and it's this, that God makes this everlasting covenant with his people. That I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to provide for you. I'm going to sustain you. Right? So provide. Sustain. And, and not only that. I'm going to keep my promise to do that. Now look at the Old Testament. And you see all the instances of bread. In the Old Testament. Manna falling from heaven. Which is God's. How God was providing for his people. Right? But what's interesting. Is, is that of all the bread that's there. There's only one that's remaining. It's called the bread of the presence. 
the showbread. And that literally means the face, the face, the bread of the face. So it's this picture of the face of God. So now go back to, to David. Look at everything that he's going through. Everything came plummeting all down. He didn't have a lot of hope. He was running. He was afraid for his life. Can you imagine the feels that he must have had? He, he wasn't with folks. He was alone. He wasn't uh, up in spirits. In fact, he was so distraught or so upset that he had to figure out a way to explain it all. And so he lies. He's in a bad position. You know, God doesn't do anything on accident. He's intentional and purposeful in everything. God doesn't allow anything on, on, on accident. He allows stuff to happen. And look at all this stuff that's facing David. And here, here he comes to the tabernacle. And he's given this bread. The show bread. Do you imagine the two things that he was thinking about? The, the things that God was reminding him of? I have a covenant with you, David. I keep my promises. And this is a reminder of that. That I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to promise and keep that promise. Broken bread. Uh, keep that promise. I'm not going to give up on you. And even though the times are going to get rough, I need you to have the assurance that I'm going to sustain you. So now, go back to that, so that moment. Think about this, this moment. David is running and he runs, he runs to the tabernacle. And all that's left, he's hungry because he, remember, he was three days in the field. Guy was hungry, maybe hangry, right? Three days in the field and he comes running up and, and he says, hey, just give me any bread that you have, any food that you have. Oh, all we got is, is, is the bread of his presence. All we got is the reminder of God's covenant. All we got is, is his promise. All we got is, is this, this idea that God will be a complete sustainer for you. That's all we got. That's all we got, buddy. Hi, he's got nothing. He, he's overwhelmed, but this is what we got. And we're going to give it, I'm going to give it to you. But you got to make sure that if you give it to anybody else, that you and them are consecrated, set apart, holy, set aside for God. You're, you're clean. You're honoring God. You're going to honor God. He said, yes, yes, this is what we do. So all this stuff ahead of time that, that David faced, Hiding, running, fearful, so that he could have the assurance of God. So that he could know or be reminded that God is a complete sustainer. Because I'm telling you something, I know he did not feel it in the moment. I know that he wasn't certain of all that God was going to get him. God was going to have his back. God was going to take care of him. He, he, he wasn't sure of any of those things. But God sets out this a reminder to him. And just the simplest of act. Bread? Of all things, Bread. You know, it's amazing that, that God continues this picture of bread and the bread of the presence, right? When we look at Jesus in John 6, 47. 
and 48, Jesus, Jesus stands up. And 44, he says, no one can come to the Father except through me. Right? So he's, he's making this statement that, hey, I'm the only way. But then he makes a bigger statement in 47. I tell you the truth. He who believes has everlasting life. Do you remember what the bread represented? An everlasting covenant. Right? And then listen to this, this phrase that he says right after it. I am the bread of life. So not only, not only do we see this picture of, of David in this moment where everything's falling together, every, uh, falling apart, and, and David shows up and all they got is the showbread and all they've got is the bread of his presence. All they got, all this is, is just a reminder of God's everlasting covenant that he'll be his complete sustainer. He'll be his complete provider. That's all we got right here. And then in the New Testament, God himself becomes a part of his creation. And he makes this statement that should remind us of all that bread represented in the Old Testament. Jesus saying that I'm the one that gives you life. I'm the one that sustains you. I'm and the completer. I'm the one that completes you. So no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're going through, I need you to know that Jesus is the bread of presence. In fact, in fact, we see it. The, the Bible calls Jesus Emmanuel, God with us. And not, not only that, but then, then, we, then we do this thing here called communion up in the front. We got bread and we got juice. And, and again, it, it's Jesus breaks this bread and he says, this is my body which is broken for doing remembrance of. Wow. But he doesn't just leave it there. Look at verse 51. I am the living bread. The come down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give to you for the life of the world. Wow. So David is, is marching around and he's lost all hope. He's, he's abandoned uh, whatever and he's just like, I just need something. I just need some sort of reminder. I just need, uh, I'm hungry. I just need food. And he doesn't just give food. He gets a reminder of an everlasting covenant that God has made to David and he makes to us through Jesus. The bread of life. Complete sustainer. Not just the bread of life, but God himself. Jesus has made that statement and he's saying this. I'm the manna. I'm the one that you need. I'm the one that, that's... The fulfillment of all this stuff in history. I'm the one that David needed. Right? And, and just this amazing picture. God does all this so that David would have assurance. Because God made a promise and he keeps it. That's the first assurance. And God is a sustainer and he completes it. That's the second assurance. And God, he's victorious and he fights the battle. That's the third assurance. But the assurance is not, is not in the bread on the battle part. Right? Look at what David asked for. Go back, flip back. Oopsie doopsie artichokey. Flip back to verses 8 and 9 of chapter 21. 
David asked Ahimelech, don't you have a spear or a sword here? <laughs> I haven't brought my sword or any other weapon because the king's business was urgent. David sh shows up. He runs. And now, what kind of soldier runs without a sword? One that's in a hurry. He's fearful. He's not ready for anything. He doesn't even have food. He just took off. Right? And he goes, hey, don't you have any weapons around here? Now, if you were here when I talked about David and Goliath, I, I told you that there was something that was going to be a reminder later on. This is it. So David, he took that sword and he put it in his tent, right? He, he set it aside. That was his spoils from the victor. But why, why, why is it at the tabernacle and not still in his tent? He took David's sword he wanted in battle, which is rightfully his, right? Why, why, why is it in the tabernacle? Why, why isn't it in his tent? Yeah, is that an interesting thought? And here David is, and he's like, hey, where is, I, do you got anything that I can fight with? You got a stick, a sword, a spear, anything? And he says, well, well we got this one thing. Here's, here's why it wasn't in his tent. So, so this picture is believed that David took that sword after he put it in his tent, he went back and he grabbed that sword and he went to the tabernacle and he dedicated it to the Lord and he left it there. What kind of dedication to the Lord is that? This is what the dedication is. That it was God that won the battle. That it was God that fought the battle. That it was God who was victorious. And so therefore, that sword isn't his spoils. It's God's. And so he put it back. He put it where it belonged. Because he knew that the battle wasn't his. It was God's. So, so that battle that was fought was God's. Now, David, as this 20-year-old kid, uh, trying to figure out what's next, trying to see how to navigate the next stage in life that would be even more traumatic than what he just experienced when he was running. He needed assurances from God. And God gives assurances. Everlasting covenant. A promise. He always keeps his promise. That he would provide and sustain. Not anybody else. Not in the food that he ate. But in almighty God. And that it's God that wins the victory he's the one that fights the battles so as David continued to navigate the rest of this moment in history we see David running and hiding we also see him fighting see him doing some things that are not right and we see him doing some things that are right but through it all God wanted him to remember. God wanted to remind him of. Give him assurance. That he's going to take care of all that stuff. Do you imagine this moment when David grabs the sword? Remember what he said? There's none like it. Give it to me. There's none like it. Give it to me. 
Do you imagine all the thoughts that he had when nobody else would stand up, when nobody else would look for the freedom of God's people, when nobody else would, would do the right thing, David stood up. The least likely. That wasn't his position. Can you imagine that moment? I wonder as we look to this new year what it would be like if you just took a moment to be reminded how God saves how God provides how God sustains do you have any of those moments to look back on and go, man, only God can do that. When David heard about that sword, I imagine that he was reminded how God can defeat any giant and that the giant that he was facing was small in comparison to the giant that he faced. So my hope for you this morning is that you would be reminded that God keeps his promises. No matter what your circumstances are, no matter what your feels are, no matter what you're facing, that he's always faithful that you would be reminded that no matter what your bank account looks like, no matter what your relationships look like, God is the complete sustainer and provider. So no matter what you face, no matter what you're going through, he's enough. That you would be reminded <laughs> that you may be facing some pretty big giants right now. It may be dark and dreary and hopeless. But God, I bet God has defeated giants that were greater than that in your life. So this morning, my ask is this, is that you will remember be reminded of how great God is. But also that you would be like David. Instead of running to all these other things, hoping that they would fulfill you, you would run to God. And you would seek him and let him prove, demonstrate, show you again that he'll completely sustain you. He'll provide for you. Maybe you're here this morning and you haven't had that David moment. where you saw God provide a victory. If you haven't had that, and you're saying, I got nothing to look back to. Well, you can make that moment now. You can make the decision that today is that moment that you'll look back to and go, remember when I gave God my addiction. Remember, remember when God overcame that broken relationship. Remember when, remember when God healed my heart from loss and defeat. Re remember when God took my bitterness 
Remember when I, I was fighting and struggling and God's joy became my strength. Remember? So if you haven't had that moment, that moment you can have. Because God, he's always faithful. He keeps his promises. He's the sustainer. He always is victorious. And he will complete you. Would you take a moment to bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your... reminder (laughs) that you are so gracious and so good and so kind Lord Jesus in this moment right now God if there are folks that are have a moment that's just so overwhelming to them that they need to move towards you would you just take this time to speak to their hearts Lord Jesus, if there are folks here this morning that are fighting addiction, I ask that you would give them this moment, that you would break the addiction, that you would defeat that giant, that they would step in faith, trusting that you promise you can defeat them. God, if there are folks this morning that are struggling in their relationship, their marriage, God, I pray that you would overcome their giants, that you give them peace and victory. And God, If they need humility in that moment, I pray that you would give it to them. Oftentimes, victory in relationships is a bending of a knee. It's not a puffed up chest and a swinging of a fist or a screaming of a voice. It's a bended knee. So if you're struggling in a relationship, it's a bending of a knee. God, this morning we also lift up finances the folks are struggling in their finances and don't seem to be able to make things meet pray that you give them victory in that pray that you would give them assurance that you'll provide because you always do Lord Jesus, we desperately need you. God, I ask that you would have your way. We're going to continue this moment of just reflection with communion. Last week, last week, Pastor Sean was talking about packing to go on a trip with the littles. And sometimes before we go places, we think of everything that we need, and then we go enjoy our vacation. But you know the feeling of coming home, and you're just like, no matter how good vacation can be or time away can be, coming home is good. And so just a few minutes ago when Pastor Sean was talking about the people, they're talking about moments where we can look back and 
know when God has filled and we can have those moments of remember when. If we were able to look around the room in those moments, there were probably people that were nodding. They can hold on to those moments and there were probably some people who haven't had one yet. When we go on vacation and then we come home, that's like, there's nothing like being home. I love being home. The people who were nodding have had moments where they have felt so at home with Jesus. There's no better place of just security and just that assurance that David had. There's such assurance after you've had your first at-home moment with Jesus, when you've invited him into your heart and you let him lead. There's nothing like those at-home moments. Sometimes when I get home, though, I don't want to unpack my bag. <laughs> I just want to be home. And God wants us to unpack our bags this morning. We're supposed to examine our, heart, our hearts before we take communion. And I just want to remind you that in 1 Peter 5, 7, it says, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. He wants, whoever's going to come help with communion, if you could make your way forward. He wants... For you to have a moment and examine your hearts. The things that you don't know how they're going to turn out. <laughs> the things that you are anxious about. The relationship that is super struggling. The finances that aren't there. <laughs> God is a God of assurance. God is a God of answered prayers. God is a God of best for you. So this morning, would you take a moment as they're passing out? the elements that you would just examine your heart. Remind yourself of times that he has been the victory in your life. But don't leave here this morning with unpacked bags or baggage. Take this moment right now, please, and examine your hearts. Let God take those things that are in your heart that you kind of maybe want to hold on to still. <laughs> he wants you to unpack your bags this morning. First Corinthians 11:28 says everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. I'm just going to pray over this moment as they continue to pass everything out. God, I thank you that you know our hearts. I thank you that you know our thoughts. I thank you that you're giving this, us this opportunity right now to unpack our bags. I thank you that you went before us, that you died on the cross <laughs> for all of the stuff that's still in our bags. God, I pray we wouldn't leave here today with baggage. That you're ready just to clear it all. You've taken care of it already. God, that you are the victor, that you are the stainer, and you are the answer of promises. God, I pray that we would be bold enough and courageous enough to let go of the things that we've been holding on to and put them in your hands. Thank you that we can empty our hearts of the junk today, but be filled right back up with your promises and your love. First Corinthians 10, 16 says, is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give, a, give thanks, a partic participation in the blood of Christ. And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ. What a privilege and an opportunity we have right now this morning. For whenever you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever eats the bread or drinks of this cup, okay, that's what we're gonna do right now. <laughs> We're going to take the bread together. Jesus, I thank you for your life. I thank you for your body that was broken, for everything that is wrong with who we are, everything that's impure, everything that isn't of you. God, I thank you for this opportunity to remember what you've done for us. Thank you that this church family, that we can just take this together and have a moment of letting you lead and letting you take all of the anxieties and junk out of our heart as we give it over to you. Let's take it together.
This represents the blood that was shed for our sins. So thankful for this opportunity so that we can leave here without baggage, so that we can leave here with a clean slate, so that we can walk out here confident, knowing that he's leading, that he has good things for us, so that we can just be certain that there are victories ahead, that he holds our pain and our question marks and our empty wallets <laughs> and our calendars. He's such a good so that God. Let's take it together. Jesus, I thank you for this morning. God, I thank you that you are such a sustainer. God, that you are a God of answered promises, that you're a God who leads. I thank you that we'll be able to look back at this morning and know that this was a moment that we handed our stuff over to you. And we'll be able to look back on all of the so that's so that you could fill in the blank, so that you could sustain us so that we would let you lead. Thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand up and worship Jesus together.
you guys would, that we all <laughs> would not try to pick up the baggage that we just laid down. That we wouldn't try to take back the things or carry out this church what we just gave to him. Leave it here. I pray that this morning that we would be a consistent people, that we would be people who reach out to Jesus, that we let him lead, that we hear his voice, and that you would encourage, encourage your other church family and the people around you to do the same thing. Don't leave here with baggage. And if you held on to it a little bit ago and you didn't do anything with it, there are people here that will pray with you. Opportunity is not over. Have a great week. Go and be blessed and be consistent in your prayers and in your Bible. Have a good week. Thank you.